Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I think so. Um, so, I would like to thank Sasha Bufetov for, for the opportunity to speak here. And uh, it's my first time in Italy. I've never been here before, and I'm thoroughly enjoying this country. It's really nice. And, but it's too hot for me at the moment, so maybe I'll come again in the spring or something like this. Um, so this is a joint project with uh, Etienne Le Masson from Bristol, and uh, it's, uh, it's something about, uh, essentially about the uh, uh, Laplace operator. So I know that in the audience, I mean, it's mostly consisting of people working on dynamics, but I mean, I want to talk a little bit about the Laplace and what it is. So, <coughs> so it's a quite central differential operator in analysis and PDEs, and uh, let me just uh, briefly mention what it, what it is, like intuitively or heuristically speaking. So you take a compact Riemannian manifold, okay, and then you define the Laplacian of a function f defined on the manifold to be roughly the rate at which the, these spherical averages deviate from the value of the function at the point x. So here you take a point x in the manifold and you take just draw a sphere in the usual metric in the manifold, and then just study the average value of the function. Okay, you get some number, and then you just measure how much this deviate from this value. So for example, harmonic functions are those where the Laplacian is zero, so then here, this average is equal to, the, to this thing, so there's no deviation. Okay, so in the, in the R2, it's just this, just this usual, you've probably seen this definition before, you can define it using second derivatives. So that's the Laplacian. Okay, and so there are these specific numbers, if you have a compact surface, these so-called eigenvalues of the Laplacian. So they are just those numbers that satisfy this equation. There are these functions that satisfy this equation. That, okay, so you take the Laplacian to point x, so this deviation rate, and then you just ask that, okay, it's roughly the same as a constant times the function itself. And that's an eigenfunction. And okay, so there are several ways to choose those eigenfunctions. Like, there's no mean, like, it's a unique way. That in some surfaces, like in the, in the ball, there's a lot of multiplicities. So a given eigenvalue may have several different eigenfunctions, but then you can just choose one. <coughs> and uh, they are really like uh, building blocks for harmonic analysis. That's one of the fundamental things you can use them for. Like, if you want to do Fourier analysis or other things, you can define an orthonormal basis using, you can choose them so that they form a basis, like if you go through the eigenvalues. And that's a very standard thing that you usually do in, the, in analysis. And the other thing is that there are these like, uh, more applied things that you can use them to like, somehow reconstruct your surface. Like in some cases, you can, there are these questions about whether if you know the eigenvalues, can you reconstruct, the, uh, let's say, in here, you have this, these are the, this surface is just uh, actually the disk, and these are some, some of the uh, solutions to the, I think it's the wave equation in this case. And you can ask if you can solve, solve the, <coughs> solve the, like finding out those numbers, if you can then say something about the surface, and also if you know the eigenfunctions, can you reconstruct somehow the manifold efficiently if you can do something with it. So the final thing is that, uh, these eigenfunctions, uh, there's a natural dynamics in quantum mechanics. I don't want to talk about that much, but there's there are so-called stationary quantum states. So if you think about just take an eigenfunction of the Laplacian here, and you take the eigenfunction, modulus of the eigenfunction squared, then that's a probability density. It's a, it's a probability density function. And uh, it, give, it describes you somehow the uh, position, the probability position of a particle in the system. So here, these are pictures, these are billiard actually, so corresponding to some domain, and there are some boundary conditions for, the, for this equation here, some directly boundary conditions. And then you are solving the eigenvalue equation, and you get these functions, and there are some distribution of this thing. So they look sometimes like this, and sometimes they look like this if you change the energy level, so different eigenvalues. Okay, so here are the eigenfunctions, and I would like to now use dynamical systems to study this, these things. So that's the basis of this whole, whole talk. So, uh, so one of the standard dynamical systems on a Riemannian manifold is the geodesic flow. So you put it on the cotangent bundle here. 
So that's just uh, because you have directions and then you have the points in the, in the definition of the geodetic flow. So what do you do here? So you pick a point and you pick a direction and then you're, you're looking around you to that direction. You want to go to the, to the direction where you minimize the distance. You don't want to go like uh, where the distance is going to be large and then you like, locally minimize the distance. So that's the geodesic flow. And you get the new point and new direction at that point. And then you just flow around the, flow around the space and you get some new points. <coughs> so that's the geodesic flow on this, this, this place, space. So the typical geodesics of interest that you usually study here are <coughs> closed geodesics. So those geodesics that you return to the same point, you have the same direction, so it's pointing to the same place. So it's always looping around in this space. So these things are important on, for algebraic reasons and other things if you want to describe the topology and other things. And the other things which is more, more also quite important there, but here it's more useful is this equidistributed geodesics. So those geodesics that somehow equidistribute the whole surface. So you begin from some area in the surface. So here, actually, the area is in the, in the cotangent bundle. And then you somehow visit it uniformly around the whole time. So if you take the statistics, then you're seeing roughly the volume. So this is the Liouville measure. So that's the most uniformly distributed measure on the surface. And you're seeing roughly how much mass you have there in this frequency. And uh, <coughs> so the Liouville measure, just to remind you, it's just uh, the projection of the Liouville measure is the uniformly distributed measure on the surface. So if you project it onto this, uh, this surface, then you just get the so-called Lebesgue measure of the volume on the surface. So that's just a natural, absolutely continuous invariant measure on the cotangent bundle here that you use. <coughs> OK. So an ergodic geodesic flow is a flow where almost all geodesics are equidistributed. OK, so I'm lying here because I define the equidistribution to be just for the open sets. You're testing for the open sets. But if you just test it for all the sets of positive measure, then that's real definition or equivalent definition of ergodicity by the Birkhoff ergodic theorem. So that just means that if you take a typical initial point and a typical direction, you go out the flow, then most of the geodesics just look like these blue geodesics. So the red ones are quite rare in this sense. OK. <coughs> so, so there are several examples where you can have these like hyperbolic surfaces where the curvature is, just, let's say, constant negative minus 1. That's where you have like actually quite a heavily mixing geodesic flow. So these are obtained from the hyperbolic plane by, for example, these group actions. You can define using them and everything. And the other things are some domains, some billiards. So you can define the billiard flow and uh, define a suitable Riemannian metric here. And then you have an ergodic flow in this case. So if the boundary has certain shapes, then you can have this ergodicity. <coughs> so why am I talking about ergodicity? And then I was talking about the eigenfunction, the Laplacian. Well, the point is that uh, if you have an ergodic geodesic flow on the surface, it's a condition of the surface. Not all the surfaces satisfy that, that the geodesic flow is ergodic. But if they satisfy that, you can say actually quite many things about the eigenfunction of the Laplacian. And uh, there's a numerical evidence that showing that uh, if the geodesic flow is ergodic, then the, this probability density, if you remember, for the eigenfunction of the Laplace, so here we have the eigenfunction of the Laplace, you're choosing a basis, so it's the orthonormal basis, uh, they should equidistribute. So this is just more like numerical evidence if you're just doing, just pick your domain and do some computer simulations, you start to see that they somehow spread around quite, quite evenly. So here, for example, in this domain, uh, you would have this uh, billiard flow and then uh, with some boundary conditions here. And then <coughs> on here, you have some energy levels. So some eigenfunctions here, and you choose some eigenvalue. You see something like this sometimes, sometimes you see this. But if you start to increase the energy, you should start to see something quite uniformly distributed. And uh, <coughs> the theorem here is this quantum ergodicity theorem, that if you have an ergodic geodesic flow, then these things converge to the function one weakly. So what does this mean? So you take the, remember that the, uh, except for a density one subsequence, this is very important here. That there is like a, you throw away a few of the eigenfunctions you hate, and then for, you don't like them, and then you just have, have the rest and they converge to one. So there is this specific subsequence which is non-constructive in general, but how do you find it? And uh, this just means that you have uh, this probability density, so this is just a function square, and then you multiply it by the volume, so the volume of the surface, and this measure converges weakly to the volume measure. That's what this 
means this weekly here, so devol uh, converges weekly to devol. So that's an equidistribution. That's quantum ergodicity. That's what it means. And then you have this density one subsequence, what you, what you have here. And this is necessary. So in this uh, uh, recent, like uh, maybe um, I think eight years ago or something like this, Hassel constructed like uh, ergodic examples where you have this ergodic flow, but you don't have quantum unique ergodicity. So quantum unique ergodicity would mean that there's no density one subsequence here. And uh, so, so the question is that this, um, for example, hyperbolic surfaces and other surfaces are more chaotic in some sense than, uh, than just ergodic. So for example, hyperbolic surfaces, there, there's this like, very strong mixing properties for the flow. So now the question is, can you use that to get rid of these problems that you have here, like this tension one subsequence? Because in this Hassel's example, you don't have this, uh, this like, exponential mixing things going on. So, <coughs> So the conjecture here is that you should be able to do that, and, uh, but this is still open, so you cannot, I mean, it's still, uh, I mean, there are some partial things that you can do in this setting, so there's this, uh, if I'm a hyperbolic surface, actually the conjecture on hyperbolic manifolds, so it's high dimensions as well, but then if you can have this without the density subsequence, and uh, this is the quite famous result where you, if you assume that your basis of eigenfunctions, so-called Hecke, basis, so you choose a specific basis, and then you choose the surface such that it has, okay, it's some congruence uh, subgroups of the SL2Z, I think, or something like this, and then from those uh, surfaces you can do something, <coughs> you can actually prove that there's no exceptions on those specific examples of the orthonormal basis. So you can use the arithmetic information about the manifold or other information to do overcome this information, but still this, if you just have the general thing, is to be open. So <clears throat> my talk today is not going to be about solving the problem, sorry, it's still open, but then uh, I'm going to talk about something which is kind of intangent being developing with this quantum ergodicity theorem. So <clears throat> it's going to be something called the quantum ergodicity in the level aspect. So now you have some idea what is quantum ergodicity. It's uh, uh, equidistribution theory of the eigenfunctions of the Laplace and in the high energy limit. So you want to understand what they look like. They look like the function one typically. But here, what we want to do is that uh, instead of taking large frequency, we take some fixed frequencies. So <coughs> we would take some, so here's the spectrum of the Laplace and you have the lambda one, lambda two, lambda two, so on. And you just fix some interval and you want to study the eigenfunction of the Laplacian such that the eigenvalue hits this interval. It's just throw away all these others. others. Okay, <coughs> well, what's the point of this? I mean, in, for example, this picture has just two eigenvalues here, so there's no equidistribution for two eigenfunctions. There's no point of this thing. So you have to do something. You have to change something instead of... So you don't want to go to the high energy limit, so that would be going to large eigenvalues, but you want to somehow change that there are more eigenvalues here. So, okay, there's this one four, which I will maybe return later. It's just uh, for specific reasons. You cannot choose the interval to be less than one four. So, instead of doing large eigenvalues, you just study those, you just study some kind of a geometric change in the manifold. So what I want to do is that I want to somehow change the geometry in a way that you get more eigenvalues here. So <clears throat> there are some examples, like for example, volume, genus, and injectivity radius, which you can use as a parameter to change the geometry. So what I want to do is now study these properties with this eigenfunction squared with Laplace, and if you vary the geometry. Okay, so, <clears throat> so let's take this injectivity radius as the main example. So this is somehow also motivated by several other papers where other people have been doing this injectivity radius. The the key thing, I will come to it soon. So there's a motivation, why do you want to study this as well? And uh, <clears throat> so if you take the hyperbolic surface, so you have the constant negative curvature minus one, you can define the point-wise injectivity radius as follows. So you take a point X here, and then you draw the largest possible ball you can have here with the property that if you stand at the point X, so you're looking around you to every direction, you just see the hyperbolic plane. Like you look to the horizon, you see nothing but the hyperbolic plane. You just take the largest possible ball, it looks like around you like a hyperbolic plane. So the surface is not a hyperbolic plane, but locally it can look like a hyperbolic plane. 
So the initiative radius is giving you the largest possible ball you can have over here. And okay, so that's, that's the po at the point X. You can study different other points. So you take the infimal point, so that's the last, the smallest place. So you can have several different points, and then you can have a, the injectivity radius at different points. Okay, <coughs> so that's your, uh, sorry, that's your geometric parameter. And uh, we would like to now study what happens if you change the injectivity radius. So if you change the injectivity, ra injectivity radius of the surface, what happens is that uh, the number of eigenvalues starts to increase on a given interval, which is not at the one four. So if it's any interval here between one four and infinity bounded interval, the number of eigenvalues starts to increase in this interval. And uh, <coughs> if you go to these pictures, are probably not the, what actually happens when you increase injectivity radius. I don't know what happens. I, don't, I cannot visualize it in my head. I just, this is very completely wrong, but I think the genus increases by the injectivity radius, but uh, yeah. Uh, it probably looks something like this, that it's, it just gets bigger and bigger. It's the hyperbolic plane. Okay, so yeah, so you get more eigenvalues, so now you can ask, do you have equidistribution? So you have this interval of eigenvalues, and then you can ask when you have equidistribution. So that would mean that, okay, you're increasing eigenvalues, you get more and more eigenfunctions here, and you can ask if there's an equidistribution for those eigenfunctions. So that's the level aspect, quantum ergodicity question or conjecture. And uh, this was asked by Colin de Vertier that, uh, okay, this, this is precisely the form. So you take, uh, this is once again the probability density. So this is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian here. And then you take the function one, you study the weak distance here. So in the weak topology, how far they are. And you take the number of eigenvalues in the interval and you sum over the eigenvalues in the interval. So they can average. So if this goes to zero, when the injectivity radius goes to infinity, this means that on average, these things are very, very small. So that means that there's like a density one subsequence in some sense that uh, these things are quite uh, small along those sequences. So let me just go back to the usual quantum ergodicity theorem. You can reformulate it in a very similar manner. So remember it was, it was formulated like this, that you have the, this converges to function one weekly along a density one subsequence, but means exactly the same as um, this, that if you take the number of eigenvalues less than lambda and you sum, and then you take to some kind of weak distance over here, then that goes to zero as lambda goes to infinity. So there's a, that means you can extract the density one subsequence as this thing gets very small. So the, in the weak topology, they get very close to each other, these two things. <coughs> so in this theorem, what you have is that instead of you have the fixed interval and you're changing the injectivity radius. Okay, so that's the, that's the theorem. So we go to the next slide. So this is some previous work. So this is something that uh, motivated these questions. For example, it, in <coughs> so there is, the, there is this all this field of uh, something called uh, holomorphic uh, forms, and uh, there's like an, you can prove analogous results of something called a quantum ergodicity for these things. So this is something I almost know almost nothing about. Uh, it's just something that uh, I've been reading because it's kind of motivating on this, but then this is like the techniques are completely different here. So you're using this holomorphic structure. So you, you don't study eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, but instead you study modular forms. And those things have some, some properties that you can have, you can ask similar questions about uh, there's something which is similar to eigenvalue and something like this, and you can study these things. And they have proved these level aspect results for these things already. And uh, <coughs> This is, there, there are like sequences, so there are the surfaces and the injectivity radius is changing and then they can prove that, okay, there is equidistribution in the limit. And, uh, but there's also like, uh, the other motivation is that there is like, um, <coughs> there's all this, um, I think there, it was uh, uh, Rutnik and then also Smilansky and a few other people who like uh, have been like um, advertising this Thing that if you cannot solve quantum unique ergodicity, for example, or other these very important problems in the, in the, for the surfaces, what you do is that you discretize the problem somehow, 
And then you try to prove in this toy model of discretized version some similar results, whether you can have actually this. So there are these papers, I, I think it's most of this paper which initiated this whole thing. That, well, this, well, it has been done before as well, but this like quantum ergodicity part of this thing was redone in this paper, where they proved some analog of quantum ergodicity for discrete graphs. So in that case, you can actually prove other things. And there's also been these level aspect results have been proven for this. But for the eigenfunction of the Laplacian, I think, uh, as far as I know, nothing has been done for them. So that's kind of been the motivation. So then uh, I, uh, at some point, I went to do a postdoc in, uh, in Jerusalem. So this is a, an office, 82, in a, in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I mean, Elon Linnenstrauss was in, in, in the university that we were, uh, he was the pol he was postdoc of him. And then, okay, I was not doing this stuff at all at that point. I was just doing dynamics and other things. But then, okay, you are sharing an office, and then at some point you start to discuss what are you doing, and you just join common ideas. And then kind of like we started to discuss about various things. And then uh, <coughs> with Etienne, uh, we now prove this result. So if you can, you can have this uh, level aspect theorem if you assume that they are compact hyperbolic surfaces. So in general, like, okay, you may be able to ask, maybe in general, like, uh, for compact surfaces with the ge uh, ergodic geodesic flow, but at least for compact hyperbolic surfaces, where you could define all these uh, injectivity radius and these things, then you can, you can have this problem. <coughs> and we proved some quantitative bounds with respect to the injectivity radius going to infinity, but that's just, I mean, it's just something, some, <coughs> some bounds that you can get. But okay, so <coughs> in the title of my talk, uh, I was talking about uh, something called benjamin Schramm convergence. So benjamin Schramm convergence is actually when the injectivity radius goes to infinity at most points. That's what it means. That's the definition of benjamin Schramm convergence. So there is like a, you can use the volume measure in the, in the surface and saying that, okay, at most points, there, are, there may be some exceptional points where the injective radius is not increasing, um, but if at most points it somehow increases, then it means that this surface is um, <coughs> converting into hyperbolic plane, the sense of Benjamin Schramm. I didn't want to go into the de definition because I just realized that there was just half an hour to give the talk. So I, before I had like more stuff, but I forgot the time, so I just had to remove everything. So I just talk about the injective radius, it's easier. So, okay, but some examples where you have this, like, for example, this compact hyperbolic surface, you can get these, like, congruence coverings of compact arithmetic surfaces. So they are these, taking, taking like, a compact subgroup of, uh, no, no, take a, take a subgroup of the SL2Z, which is, uh, produces a compact hyperbolic surface, take a, choose a subgroup such that, and take this, some called, something called congruence coverings. And those things, when you, when you change the parameter of the congruence, you get a sequence by the injective radius. Uh, not, not just the index there is, as the Benjamin Schramm convergence happens. And then there are some other examples given by surfaces arising from normal co compact lattices. So there are some examples I can, I can produce of these things. So they are on the paper. So I have at the moment five minutes left, I think. And uh, I really thought there was slightly more time. So I, I, I had something on the proof, but there's, I don't know what can I say about the proof. Uh, so one thing about the proof is that you have this, remember that there was this interval, and you studied the number of eigenvalues in an interval, and I, I said to you that, okay, the number of eigenvalues will increase. But there's actually, you need more than that. You need, uh, you need to actually use some uh, real properties. There's something called uh, Y law. But the Y law is usually meant for like large eigenvalues. You studied the asymptotic rate of, the rate of growth of eigenvalues, number of eigenvalues in a, that are less than lambda, but now we need to study the growth rate in an interval, and there are some like uh, results where you can use the Benjamin Schramm convergence, uh, so the injective radius at most points increases, implies something of the volume growing, and then you have some rate. Uh, there's this uh, paper of these seven guys where they prove that uh, you can have like these things coming out. This is very important to have the uh, estimating this part of the proof. And the other part of the proof where you have the sum of the eigen, uh, you, sum of the eigenvalues, and then you have this uh, distance, weak distance of the eigenfunction square mile to one, then you need all these, like, there's like uh, <coughs> all this kind of machinery. Because I have only three minutes left, I just say one word, so not one sentence, that uh, typically in quantum ergodicity, how do you prove these things? 
is that uh, you use something called microlocal analysis or semi-classical analysis or pseudo-differential operators or this kind of uh, machinery. And uh, that's the typical way how you approach this in the large eigenvalue limit. But for a long time, like, uh, people have been trying to prove something like this, some, some result like what we did, but they weren't able to do it with pseudo-differential methods. I don't know if you can prove them with this. So we had to use this like, more um, like a uh, hands down method with, without using pseudo differential analysis. We use this like uh, disk averages. And um, there were some very strong uh, results in ergodic theory for those things we, we were able to employ in this setting. And that's the key here. So these things don't appear if you use just the pseudo differential methods, I think. But if, at least in our case, you can do like uh, apply this method. And uh, <coughs> And there's also one thing that if you want to do this in a other setting than just uh, hyperbolic surfaces, you really need this spectral theory of the radio integral operators, which is very specific for hyperbolic surfaces. So constant negative curvature minus one. So if you go to variable curvature or anything like that, then everything collapses here. So I don't know if you can do this part at all. So there was something that we were thinking if you can do variable curvature, but then this part really <laughs> doesn't really work. But this part doesn't, this part doesn't. I think this also, you can do something here. I don't know. But, um, so the next step is my, basically the end of the talk. I'm asking questions from myself now. So uh, can you do non compact hyperbolic surfaces? Yes, there are, <coughs> I think these, my, many of these things can be, in, like there are some parts which can be done. This is also this Selberg part that can be done for non compact surfaces. So I think there's some hope, but it's, the problem is that they can be continuous spectrum and all these things appear and then I don't know what to do exactly there. What's the formulation of the problem? And okay, high dimensions. In the high dimensions, I think you might be able to do something, but then I'm not sure. Uh, <coughs> I mean, you could use this very similar methods there. I think you can just use the HN instead of H. But then I don't know. And the variable curvature, as I said, there was also already the problem about the Selberg part. So you use the Selberg trace formula and this, uh, this kind of theory and that goes quite well. And there's the quantum unique ergodicity conjecture, which you could ask in this setting as well if you have, instead of having like this density one subsequence averaging, you remove the averaging and take some kind of maximum, for example. And uh, <coughs> yeah, there was this one final thing that uh, I shouldn't say usually. I think I've seen some pictures that these things have fractal features. So remember that you have these weak limits of these things, and they converge to one in the quantum ergodicity theorem. But then uh, <coughs> sometimes they don't, and then uh, they may ex exhibit these kind of like a more non-uniform features. So this is like the, would be converging to one, but here it would be converging to something slightly different, and they can actually look like fractal measures. So that would be interesting to actually understand what they really are. So that's my talk. Thanks.